I'm Reverend Dr. Lucy O'Harris. I'm the director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice and the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And it's great to be here. Well, it is so great to be sitting here chatting with you uh, and to meet you in person finally. Know. Um, you know, it feels weird to say I'm a big fan of your work <laughs> because <laughs> it's like that work being, I don't know, changing the world, organizing <laughs> the poor, and you know, really just fighting like hell for poor and working people. And um, it's, yeah, just a real honor and a privilege to be sitting here with you. Well, and the same, and, and it's the work that we're all doing Thank you. <laughs> together. Yeah. It's an honor to be in the struggle <laughs> with you. Exactly. And, um, you know, we're, we're obviously here in Philadelphia mm -hmm. um, to be part of this great conference that the Media Inequality and Change Center, a uh, joint venture between the schools of communication at Penn, Penn University and uh, Rutgers mm -hmm. to talk about media, politics, power, everything in between, right? And so we just got done recording this great panel with you, me, Wendy Brown, Chenjirai, Kumanyika. So I got all my juices flowing, but you know, I feel like the last time we had you on the Real News Network was when you were talking to my good buddy and colleague, Mark Steiner, um, for the Mark Steiner Show. And we were kind of gearing up for the massive an important march on Washington that you and uh, the Poor People's Campaign led. Um, so I was wondering if like we could sort of start there and just give folks like an update. Like what have y'all been up to since then? <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah. So on June 18th, uh, the Poor People's Campaign organized uh, one of the largest gatherings of poor and low income people um, in U.S. history, about 100,000 people, maybe more strong, um, on Pennsylvania Avenue. It was a mass poor people and low-wage workers assembly, a moral march on Washington and to the polls. Um, and it was, you know, the first couple hours of the assembly was poor and low-income folks from states all across the country, you know, putting out uh, their plight, fight, and insight, right? But putting out their stories and their solutions and, and demanding that this nation and this world, you know, hear, see, and do something about the scourge of racism and poverty, ecological devastation, the denial of healthcare, you know, militarism, this war economy, and this false and really evil distorted narrative of religious, especially white Christian nationalism. Um, and and the into the polls uh, is, is a lot of what um, immediately following that powerful assembly, um, uh, we, you know, threw ourselves into in the Poor People's Campaign. And so, you know, we reached out to millions, about 7 million poor and low income, um, uh, what is considered low propensity voters um, in about 16 uh, states, um, states where there's a high percentage of poor and low income voters, and also states where if, if just a small percentage, less than 20% of poor and low income voters were to turn out, um, they could exceed the margin of victory. Um, they could shift the entire political calculus. And, and in the Georgia runoff, we reached out to every poor and low income registered voter in the state um, and touched folks, you know, in many cases, multiple times. Um, talking about the real issues, the real moral issues of our day and, and, the, and the issues that, that, that folks, especially poor and low income people who make up one third of the, of the electorate, right? Mm -hmm. Not just those that can vote, but those who are voting. Mm -hmm. um, and in, you know, battleground, you know, races and states, it's often like 40, 45% of, of the voters are poor and low income people. And, and so it's a powerful, probably the most powerful kind of voting block of, of people who, who do hold in our, in our hands, in our votes, the power to actually shift the entire political landscape. And so, you know, that, that was really important work. Um, uh, you know, it was important to, to have folk hear their name and condition by being reached out to, whether it was in a canvas or a, a text or a phone uh, call, um, and you know, realize that we indeed have have a, a role to play and a and a power to bring, um, you know, to enlivening and enlarging this, you know, what is now an impoverished democracy, but but which can be. You know, a society that that works for everybody, and and then we we've also just been keeping on doing the the 
the the long and slow work of organizing, organizing, organizing. Um, you know, the Poor People's Campaign is organized in more than 35 states across the country, um, made up of coordinating committees that are, are led by poor and low-income folk and faith leaders and moral leaders and other advocates and activists. Um, and and so folk have just been continuing to 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 you know kind of keep the pressure on, legislate you know uh, you know push forward. Uh, push for legislation that, you know, matters and, and lifts the load of poverty and addresses these interlocking injustices um, and, and, and kind of continues to raise the call um, uh, that it doesn't have to be this way. This is not as good as it gets. Um, the, you know, we, we have the solutions, we have the resources to, to do something about all of the injustices that are impacting our communities. Um, and it's when poor and low income people come together, band together with people from all walks of life that we have the power to, to really make society be what it, what it could be and should be and, and needs to be. Um, Preach, sister. I was going to say, you should be a <laughs> reverend or something. <laughs> like, well. I mean, and it's just so important, right, to underscore that, right? Because we, you know, we reported a bit on this for the real news. Um, when we were talking to, you know, union members like at Unite Here, mm -hmm. I mean, they went balls to the wall, uh, both in 2020 and in 2022 in battleground states like Arizona, Georgia, and you guys, the Poor People's Campaign, like, you know, it was y'all like really doing that painstaking work of reaching out to folks, mm -hmm. getting canvassing, getting in conversations with people. And I feel like, Immediate, I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but like immediately after the midterm elections, it was like, oh, the red wave didn't happen. Or, you know, it was all the horse race stuff. And like no one was talking about the people who like was on, were on the ground producing that result. And like I wanted to just sort of hover on that for a second, right? Because we, we just had this great panel together, right, where we were sort of talking about the role that media plays in all of this, right? In the sort of political mobilization in this country and beyond. And I think you and I like had a similar sort of take on this, which is like, there are certain political problems that exist in the media that become so talked about and they seem so imposing and people just start taking them as fact. Like you can't get poor working class people to vote, mm -hmm. right? Or you know, that, that the politics, this election is going to be about, I don't know, critical race theory or, you know, why queer and trans people are destroying the world, right? Not about what you just described, right? And in the same way that I feel at The Real News, like I'm constantly trying to prove to people, it's like, it's not that hard to get white collar workers and blue collar workers, you know, sex workers and teachers and all manner of working folks to talk to each other and build solidarity with each other. You just gotta do it and stop talking about it. I wanted to like just sort of ask a little bit about that, like what do you think folks out there whose sense of the political challenges in our country are really shaped by the way that like pundits and politicians talk about it? Like what do you think they, should, they can really learn from the kinds of conversations and organizing that y'all are doing at the Poor People's Campaign? Well, I think, you know, I spend much of my time in some of the poorest places um, across this country. And, you know, that is poor white communities, that's poor black communities, that's poor Latino communities, that's poor indigenous communities. It's poor communities that have a mixture of, of all of those folks mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and, and way more, uh, you know, heterogeneous communities where, um, and, and homogeneous communities. And, and what I find, um, is even though times are very hard, um, life is not good for, for really, you know, a, a huge percentage of people. I mean, again, before the pandemic, you know, we keep on putting out, but it, it has to be said, there were 140 million people, 43.5% of the U.S. population that was poor and low income. Um, and, 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 you know, the pandemic era programs have basically all ended, you know, 15 million people are about to get cut off Medicaid, uh, you know, the moratorium on evictions and, and utility shutoffs are all over, you know, we're seeing just so much more suffering and, you know, 
you know, with the child tax credit, we had 4 million kids that were risen above the poverty line and then a decision by politicians to, to not do anything that sent those 4 million <laughs> kids right back uh, below the poverty line um, and just millions more that are hovering precariously right around it. Um, and, and again, none of this has to be, but it is the reality of, of life. And yet in some of these very poor places, um, very segregated places, you know, where ecological devastation is wreaking havoc places. Um, there is an actual hope. Now it's not a, it's not a happy hope. Mm. It's not a, like, uh, you know, things are okay kind of hope. Mm. Um, but it, but it is that it doesn't have to be this way. And so, you know, when I see the kind of organizing and struggle and survival and resistance that people are doing, mm. you know, uh, I think that isn't being reported on. I mean, so both the reality um, of what people are going through so that other folks could find common cause there mm -hmm. isn't happening, but also just the, the pockets and places of, of you know, resistance and organizing and struggle. And I think when we do hear about some of it, you know, whether it's, you know, that the nurses in New York, you know, get to be in the mainstream media for mm. a couple of days. And, you know, I'm out there with the with with nurses, you know, hundreds, thousands of folks, you know, multiracial, mostly young, but but of all ages, like, you know, you know, or or whether it's, you know, Starbucks workers or or Dollar General workers, you know, as as some of these strikes as some of these organizing drives you know pop off you know others follow suit right i mean this is this is what happens people are inspired if they can do it we can do it too and and i think there's a whole lot more of that happening mm -hmm. than we ever hear about and 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 i think it's important for us to hear about the division but the division is actually a lot more about you know our politicians who again choose to to allow for you know the cutting of of all kind of programs mm -hmm. who who you know allow for us to strip our schools of any kind of real education that under that comes to reckoning with you know this this country's history um stuff that we have to know um if we're gonna not make the same mistakes that have happened and for gonna you know build the kind of society where everybody's in nobody's out um but but you know that isn't what we hear about what we hear about is um you know that that desantis in florida um is doing this and this and this and not um the the powerful resistance and organizing uh that that's happening to counter that and and i think we would benefit as a society, um, and especially those of us that are in movement and in motion together, to know that we're not alone and that there's a whole lot more people that are on the side of justice and love and truth and peace than, than not. Right. Um, and, and so it's our job to figure out how do we you know, pull those folk together um, into the kind of compelling power that, in the words of Dr. King, will make those in power say yes when they may be desirous of saying no. So, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris of the Kairos Center and the Poor People's Campaign, are you telling me that poor and working people are more motivated uh, in the struggle to keep a roof over their heads, food in their children's mouths, uh, the planet from being destroyed and their homes from being destroyed with it, than they are with M&Ms and <laughs> the gender of M&Ms or, or government taking away your gas stove <laughs> like uh, this is obviously a facetious question but like we're we're also talking here about the role that corporate independent social media play in all of this and it just seems like so nuts to me sometimes to see because it feels so transparent right when corporate media makes these sort of pseudo event type hullabaloos out of some culture war issue and like it becomes like the top, like it takes up so much oxygen and all of this is happening, like you said, like all around us, but it's like, if you just watch the TV, you wouldn't know it, right? Right, and if you watch the TV, you, you think that the poor people and the poor low wage workers are, are lazy, crazy, bigoted, and stupid, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 you, and you think that, you know, uh, that that you know people are apathetic 
when they're actually engaged. You think that that people are, um, you know, uh, can't get over kind of division when they're actually figuring out ways all the time to come together with people that are like them and not anything like them um, to 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 survive and to to try to make life okay for them and their families and and I think you know. When, when, we, when we hear, if we listen to just kind of the politicians and the corporate media, we, um, we, we, we actually completely overlook uh, the kind of brilliance um, and, and, you know, creativity and, and also the kind of love of justice that the vast majority of people, you know, have. I mean, I... I I think about a bunch of the work we were doing before the midterms in West Virginia. And, and uh, you know, you keep on having Senator Joe Manchin, um, who has lost some of his power now mm. because of, of, of the, you know, the, the, the midterms. But talking about, you know, all of these kind of culture of poverty issues, all of this, like, you know, um, all of this stuff that plays into this division, right? Um, and 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 yet, you know, the vast majority of people in West Virginia, Republican, Independent, and Democrat, support you know expanding our democracy. The majority of people, Republican, Independent, and Democrat, in West Virginia, support health care, support things like a child tax credit, right? But you wouldn't, you never hear that. You 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 hear that he's not going to give up his coal stove. You know, you you hear that he's not going to, you know. You know, people are going to use drugs or going to, you know, buy drugs if they if they get their child tax credit. I mean, like stuff that that for one is is not what's happening to the majority of people, but also just like it, you know, is about driving a wedge. It's about dividing people. It's about distracting people when really folks are not divided. They're not distracted and they're and they're. And they're, you know, mad as hell mm -hmm. about how things are going, and and uh, and trying to make things better. Well, I'm like just to quickly follow up on that, because I know I gotta let you go, and I could talk to you for days, but um, it's been a long day, so I promise I won't keep you much longer. But like, I think like the other side of that too, the way this works in tandem, is like, because I guess like when I talk to workers on the Real News or for my podcast, working people, right. Um, folks who actually have to work together, you know, in a workplace where like maybe they're not working remotely or they have to like be on the same shop floor with folks, basically just like folks who have a sense of themselves and their community as being the ones that are supposedly being talked about on the corporate media. When I talk to them, they're like, oh yeah, we all know that's bullshit, mm -hmm. right? Or like, you know, like that doesn't resonate with us. So like, we don't even really think about it, but I feel like you know, the more that we become alienated from each other and the more that we connect with each other through these mediated forms, like we ask corporate media to play the world back to us instead of talking to our neighbors or, you know, just getting in conversations with the, you know, folks that we're being told to hate at our workplace, at our church, at our, at our school board meetings, stuff like that. It's like the more isolated and alienated we are, the easier it is to foment that sort of hate and distrust and loneliness. And, and so I just wanted to sort of like, I guess, end on that and that like the media side of it, the organizing side of it, I think like the antidote at the most base level is like to make people feel less alone and, and to really, I guess, sort of like try to like reestablish those seemingly lost connections that we have. And I just wanted to thank you guys for doing that work on the organizing side, because it's really what we at The Real News, like, like we take that as the model mm -hmm. for how we should do media. No, I, I really appreciate that. And I, and I do think, I mean, uh, there are multiple crises happening, mm -hmm. you know, on a, on a global level, and those all manifest, you know, in everybody's lives. Um, mm -hmm. But if we even take, you know, what the pandemic did um, and has done and continues to do in so many people's lives, you know, it, 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 you know, it's like a little microcosm of both the kind of uh, exposing and deepening the kind of fissures and injustices that, that existed um, 
pre-pandemic, um, but also really did a job in terms of like further isolating and further trying to divide and separate people. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, when you when we're out in communities all across the country, you know, in big cities and rural areas and suburbs and exurbs and small towns, you know, there there is a there there people are feeling these crises and are feeling that um, either either that we're we are alone um, or you know we keep like we can't kind of find enough common cause to, to do something about that. And, and that is where movement comes in. That is where organizing comes in, where, where folks start to see that, that you're not alone. And, and you might speak a different language and look different and live somewhere different, but, but when you start to hear the stories of, uh, you know, of poor and low wage workers, you know, talking about, uh, you know, both what folk have to do to survive, but also the the kind of vision and hope people have of of making life better for them and and everyone around. Uh, you know, I think that inspires in others. Like, oh wait, like you know, we shouldn't feel alone. We shouldn't feel ashamed. We should you know come together, rise together, and and shame a system that has you know done. Uh, you know, has, has ripped kids from families' h homes because, you know, they don't have running water or that have, you know, <laughs> will not do the right thing when it comes to, to police brutality or, or when it comes to, to guns. Um, like, how is it possible that we have shooting after shooting, violence after violence, and, and, and our politicians just hold up their hands and say there's nothing to be done? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not happening in communities. Communities know that there is something to be done. There are solutions to all of these problems at hand. Um, but you can realize those by, by organizing, organizing, organizing. And so that's what we got to keep on doing. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, Tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.